Welcome. If you eat like an Athenian, will you live to be an ancient Greek? Today, a critical look at the Mediterranean diet. Also on the program, re-crunching the crime data. A couple of researchers contend that ta the touted police policies that we credit for the plummeting crime rate in New York may be doing next to nothing. And nuclear power to solve global warming? Bill Gates has long been funding designers of a safe nuclear reactor. Is it time to give nukes a second chance? I'll be the control rod in our debate. First, the Mediterranean diet. This graphic in the latest New York Magazine shows some version of the Med diet gaining popularity way back in 1614. And after a dalliance with grapefruit in the 1930s, again Mediterranean in 1940, and of course now. The red meat you see is the caveman diet, and millennia later, Dr. Atkins. So how seriously should we take the Mediterranean diet this time around? How rigorous was the recent Spanish study that, according to the New York Times, showed a dramatic 30% risk reduction in heart attacks, strokes, and deaths from heart disease? Here to help us make sense of it all is Kevin Lomangino, who's joining us via Skype from Maine. He's a reviewer for healthnewsreview.org, a kind of consumer reports to help us evaluate health claims in the media. He is also editor-in-chief of the medical journal Clinical Nutrition Insight. And joining us as well, Dr. Heather Greenlee, assistant professor of epidemiology at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank Dr. you, Brian. Greenlee, how many uh, subjects were in the study? How many people did they follow? This is a very large study. There were seven, over 7,000 subjects in the study. It was gigantic in terms of a dietary intervention study. And they already had to have some marker of heart disease? They all had to be high risk. So they either had to have diabetes already or have one of three major risk factors. They had to be smokers, have hypertension, or have elevated cholesterol. And some were put on a Mediterranean diet, some were put on a low-fat diet. Mm -hmm. How did they define each of these, more or less? So the Mediterranean, there were actually two forms of the Mediterranean diet in this particular study. One was, uh, had higher levels of uh, extra virgin olive oil that were added to the daily diet, and the other version had an increased number of nuts that the participants ate. But in general, the med Mediterranean diet promotes uh, high olive oil or tree nuts or peanuts, a uh, lot of servings of fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, servings of fish, increased number of legumes, uh, a, a thing that they call sofrito that's um, leeks and, olive and uh, it's, onions. It's a sauce. It, it's a sauce that's cooked with olive oil that's supposed to make your food taste really good. Um, they focused on having participants eat white meats and not eat the red meats. And it was really a diet that was looking at what people should be eating as opposed to what they shouldn't be eating. What and, and that's such an interesting point because usually we talk about diets for health in terms of what not to eat. It's the low-fat diet or the low-carb diet. Right. This actually was trying to test things that perhaps we should include. Exactly, exactly. This is really a dietary, dietary pattern that's trying to look at what people should be eating as opposed to just taking away. Um, so, Kevin, the reported outcome in the New York Times, which kind of broke this story to the general public, was that there was a 30 percent reduction in serious heart outcomes, that is, heart attacks, strokes, or any kind of death from heart disease. Since you critique both studies and media coverage of the studies, do you think that conclusion was founded? Uh, I do. I think it was a strong study. Uh, you know, uh, as your other guest said, um, we don't often see uh, studies this large that are randomized controlled trials in nutrition. And, you know, this kind of trial is considered the gold standard of medical evidence. So, uh, you know, we need to take it seriously. Um, however, uh, you know, as watchdogs of the health media, we would have preferred uh, there be a little bit more balance in the reporting of the benefits of the diet. Um, the 30 percent reduction that you're talking about is, is accurate and it's real, but we think a, a relative risk number like that uh, can give people a misleading sense of what the benefit truly is. Uh, and the analogy we often make uh, in this case is to a, a 50 percent off coupon uh, for a department store. Um, the, the only problem is if you have that 50 percent off coupon, you don't know if you can use it for, let's say, a diamond necklace or the chewing gum at the checkout counter. 
uh, you really don't know what the value is. Uh, and so to have a better sense of what the value is, you need an absolute number. Right. So um, in other words, you don't know 50% off, or in this case, 30% off what? So out of the 7,000 people, if only 10 died of heart disease in the low fat group and seven, 30 percent off, died of heart disease in the, uh, the, the Mediterranean diet group, well, yeah, that's 30 percent, but the difference in raw numbers is so small that it doesn't mean anything. Is that the kind of uh, thing you're getting at? That, that's exactly what I'm getting at. Um, and in and this so case, what was it in this case? Well, the statistic that they used um, was that there were 11 events per thousand people per year uh, in the control group versus eight events per thousand people per year. And when I say events, I'm talking about cardi uh, uh, heart attacks and strokes or cardiovascular death. So that's a reduction of uh, three events per thousand people per year, which, you know, I'm not going to say that that's not significant. It's very important. Uh, if everybody ate this way, that would be a, a very important reduction in, in heart disease. But if you take the guy off the street and say, you know, how big does this seem to you? I think most average people would say, well, actually, it seems quite modest. Right. Dr. Greenlee, if my chances go from 11 in 1,000 over the next year of having one of those three negative heart outcomes mm -hmm. versus eight, eh, but you have to think about what we have. What are the options here? And so in epidemiology, we're always comparing two groups. And so yes, it, on an absolute scale, it's a modest effect. However, it's better than anything else we have out there in terms of cardiovascular outcomes in, in, in a dietary what, what, what do you mean by anything else we have out there? Um, the, uh, the American Heart Association diet has been shown to be effective, but the the a 30% risk reduction is really substantial from a public health perspective. So if we want to go out and roll out these public health messages saying, how do we want the American people to eat? Th this is very powerful. We have a very large population. So yes, maybe per 10,000 or for 1,000 people, it, it's a modest effect, but there are a lot of individuals living in the United States at this point. So it could have a large population-based effect. Re reading about the two diets, one place that it gets tricky for me is that they both seem to exclude the things that conventional wisdom already tells us are bad for your heart, mm -hmm. like dairy and red meat and commercial cakes and pastries. So if those are kept low in both diets, what's the big difference between them? Well, I think when it, you have to go back into the beginning, and I have not spoken with the, uh, with the investigators in the study, but they had to decide what their control group was going to be. So they had to decide, were they going to have a control group that ha did nothing? Or were they going to give the control group the best available evidence to date and the best, best possible choice that they had in terms of what the standard recommendations are? So the standard recommendations are at the time to follow the American Heart Association diet. So it's called an active control. So they want to take the active control, the best knowledge that we have, compare it with something new, which was this Mediterranean diet. So the actual effect compared to doing nothing, we don't know. This study doesn't show us that. Mm -hmm. um, Kevin, how about compared to drugs, statins, for example, which so many people take to lower cholesterol. Did they compare this to that, or because these were people already at risk, were most of these people on statins already anyway? Well, they were already on statins. Uh, so th that actually makes it all the more uh, significant that they found a benefit, because a lot of studies recently, like uh, with fish oil capsules, let's say, uh, haven't been able to find a benefit, because the, the researchers say uh, everybody's already on statin, so we can't get it down any lower. But in this case, they did get it lower, mm -hmm. and the effect of the of the intervention uh, at 30 percent, you know, uh, despite the fact that I don't like that number per se, it's for comparing it to statins. Uh, you know, I think it's a, a comparable effect. So if we can put these two things on top of each other, I think you know we're increasing the benefit that we can see, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I think it's important. Right, very interesting. Do you have a theory about the mechanism, or did they, Dr. Greenlee? In other words, if more olive oil and more walnuts are supposed to make our hearts healthier, how does that work? 
that's a good question. <laughs> that's not my area of expertise exactly. Um, but the idea, what they did do is they did a very good job of documenting biomarkers that are associated with cardiovascular risk. So they looked at changes in blood glucose levels. They looked at changes in insulin, I believe insulin levels. They looked in changes in um, cholesterol levels. And they were able to not just look at changes in biomarkers in the study, but they're able to look at the actual hard outcomes, which is what we're really interested in. We don't want to know whether or not these interventions change biomarkers. We want to know whether or not they affect events. And so there's, there, yeah. there's, there's, a, there's a mechanism there. Kevin, same question. Any hypothesis about this, either from you or in the paper? Uh, well, certainly, you know, omega-3 fatty acids are, are one thing that's, that's thrown about. Uh, if they're eating fatty fish like salmon, walnuts have uh, alpha linolenic acid uh, in them. Uh, certainly, we think the omega-3s are better than other types of fat. So uh, if we're eating more of those, uh, could could be that. Right. How much of it is that things like walnuts are just very filling? And since they allowed unlimited nuts in the study, if I read it correctly, if you're filling up on nut snacks through the afternoon, maybe you're not so hungry for a steak or something, and you just eat smaller meals. Is that to me? That Brian? is. Yeah, it's to you. Yeah, uh, it, it's, it's possible. We, we don't really know what uh, the effect on weight was. They said in the Time story, I think, that uh, they didn't lose weight, but uh, I don't know that the researchers uh, actually said what happened to their weight. They may be saving that for another study. Right. Well, uh, the, the, the weight angle is very interesting, Dr. Greenlee. Tell me, <clears throat> tell me what you know about that. But, you know, what I think I read in the press reports was that people on the Mediterranean diet didn't really lose weight. They didn't really gain weight, but they didn't really lose weight. Right. What they really changed was their dietary composition. And so with any of these dietary interventions, what, we're, what they demonstrated very well is that you can change somebody's pattern of what they're eating. So if you're encouraging them to eat one group of foods or many groups of foods, olive oil or the nuts, increase their in, uh, intake of fruits and vegetables, it means they're not eating other things. So they're not eating the red meats as much. They're not eating the empty carbs. And that was one of the big differences with the low-fat diet. Exactly. People found this easier to stay on. Exactly. Is exactly. that just because there were more fun foods on the menu? I don't know if it's fun foods. It's foods that might be, taste better, foods that are part of what they're used to eating anyways, perhaps, just eating a little bit more of them. You have to remember, too, these are individuals living in Spain. These are not individuals living in New York City. Their, their, their background dietary pattern is going to be a little bit different than what we have here. Well, Kevin, well. how um, broadly do you think that these findings, even if they really pan out, can be applied to people in the United States. I mean, Spain is not the stereotype that some people may have, where it's a lackadaisical lifestyle, where people are taking siestas in the afternoon and not eating what we consider Western foods. You know, it's, I think, relatively similar to us. But how applicable is it, and did the researchers deal with that? Well, I mean, certainly it's, it's better than some diets, uh, you know, they were successful at, at eating more of the things they wanted them to eat. But, you know, I'm not sure that people really understand how much olive oil they were eating and uh, consuming in the study. They weren't so much uh, eating it as guzzling it. Um, I, and I didn't really realize this until I went to see what it would cost to follow this diet. Uh, but uh, they, they talked about four tablespoons a day. Uh, and if you add that up uh, over the course of a month, and uh, Brian, I'm going to do a, my best Marco Rubio uh, impression here. But I'm going to grab this two-liter bottle uh, and show you that you're going to fill it up to about here and, and eat that much olive oil every month. Wow. So uh, it's a lot of olive oil and also a lot of nuts. Um, and the researchers or actually industry paid for all that stuff. Uh, they were given it for free. And... You know, uh, you know, I don't want to make too much of the cost issue because I think it's possible to eat well cheaply. But at the same time, if you give me that uh, a gallon of olive oil, I'm more likely to consume it than if I have to go out and buy it myself. And I think, you know, we're just not used to eating this way, and it's going to be a, a tougher sell than some people think. I did notice, Dr. Greenlee, that fairway, <clears throat> excuse me, the fairway in Red Hook that had been closed because of Sandy <clears throat> reopened like two days after this study was published. Right. And one of the things they were touting was their new expanded olive oil aisle. They have a large olive oil aisle. Now, maybe that was in the works already, or maybe they did a <laughs> really fast response and store design to what was on the front page of the New York Times two days earlier. 
Um, but olive oil is expensive. It is expensive. There's different types of olive oil, and it depends on, again, if you're spending your money for buying food on one thing, it means you're maybe not buying something else. So if you're going to go buy a bunch of steaks and consume a lot of red meat throughout the course of a month, that in the end might be more expensive than your olive oil. So I think you have to think about, again, the whole package. Um, I mean, one of the reasons that the investigators gave the individuals these things to eat for free is to really encourage them to to make these dietary changes. If people were supposed to do that on their own in this study, they, they wouldn't have been able to observe this. I, I do want to make one point. Mm -hmm. you, you asked how comparable the findings were to the U.S. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know exactly what the baseline diet is of this population. I assume that the baseline diet of this population is probably a little bit better than the baseline diet of the American population right now. So if we were going to conduct this study here in the U.S., we might, we might see an even drastic, more drastic change. Though their banking system is a little bit worse off, I think. <laughs> I don't uh, know about that. <clears throat> before you go, uh, your research specialty, I gather, is cancer and diet. Right. This study was on heart disease, but mm -hmm. does this raise questions for you about things to study regarding the Mediterranean diet and cancer prevention? Well, definitely. It's, it's a very inspirational study from a, a dietary interventionist because it shows that you can actually pull off a study like this in a very large group of people. You can get them to adhere to a diet over a long period of time, and it's possible to study the results. What we all want to know is whether or not any of these dietary changes make a difference in the long term. A and this, in this population, it did. So these studies will need to be replicated. We need to look at it again in different populations. From a cancer prevention perspective, a lot of these dietary recommendations are the same for the cancer, rec uh, cancer prevention guidelines as well as the, cancer, uh, the recommendations for cancer survivors. And so it would be fantastic to do a study like this in that population. So, Kevin, any other follow-up studies that come to your mind that you would like to see done based on this one, which seems like you're pretty impressed with? Yeah, I'm pretty impressed. I would like to see them replicated here, as you mentioned. Uh, you know, any one study can give us a false signal, even though this was a very strong study. You know, sometimes no two studies are the same. So have it done here, have it done in even higher risk people, people who've already had a heart attack. Uh, you may see an even bigger benefit in those uh, types of people. Um, maybe do it uh, in a population studying them from an earlier age and see if it uh, has a strong effect preventing it from from an earlier age. Uh, you know, I, I think this is, we're onto something here. It's just, you know, I, I want to be careful that we don't go too crazy with it because then we get accused as uh, nutrition scientists of whipsawing people one, one way and the other uh, when the science doesn't pan out. So just be a little bit cautious. Kevin, has this affected your diet at all in these days that you've known about it? Uh, <laughs> actually, it has. Um, I bought uh, a bottle of olive oil uh, just today, as a matter of fact, uh, and I looked for extra virgin uh, because that's what they used uh, in this study. And I looked for uh, a bottle that was dark because I knew that sunlight uh, can affect the antioxidant compounds uh, in olive oil. Uh, and so I'm paying a little bit more attention to it, for sure. When the skeptical reviewers start changing their behavior, then you're really <laughs> onto something. Dr. Greenlee, how about you? Uh, I, I actually try to follow this dietary pattern um, already, and so it's just uh, a little bit more fuel for the fire there. So it's and been we great. eat uh, with a lot of olive oil at home already, but I've yeah. been having more nuts, so great. we'll put it there. And by the way, this great. just in, Mayor Bloomberg is going to mandate 16 ounces of olive oil for each <laughs> low-income child. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Thank you both very much for joining us. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. It's been great. Thank you. Up next, a couple of researchers contend that the policing policies we credit for the plummeting crime rate may be doing next to nothing. Now, we begin a series called Public Intellectual about research that can affect the public's lives and our politics. We'll begin with a study by an NYU professor that uses data to call into question whether New York City police policies have had anything to do with the historic drop in crime over the last 20 plus years. It was published in the academic journal Justice Quarterly, and it raises questions about whether more police officers, the crackdown on misdemeanors, the Comstat crime measurement system, or stop and frisk have made much of a difference at all to the number of serious felonies. Joining us, Professor David Greenberg with NYU's Institute for Law and Society. Professor, welcome to the program. Thank you. What gave you the idea to test all these in the way you did? Two years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, I was contacted by two criminologists 
who wanted me to help them prepare a grant application to a foundation to seek funding for more extensive research on this topic. Uh, they had some data already collected and asked me to do a preliminary analysis of that data set uh, to ask for more money. And we have been recently notified that we will be getting money from that foundation to push this analysis farther. All right. Well, let's take these one at a time. And you, you can describe the data that you looked, like, uh, looked at. Okay. Item one, increasing the sheer number of police officers. This began under Mayor Dinkins in the early 1990s. And his police commissioner, who happened to be named Ray Kelly, uh, is often credited beginning the decline in crime, along with the mayor, that the next mayor, Rudy Giuliani, has gotten a lot more credit for. What did you look at regarding simply the increase in the number of officers? My data set consists of crime rates, uh, uh, law enforcement measures, and other factors that might influence crime rates for New York precincts between 1988 and 2001. I found that marginal increases in the number of police on the force uh, had no detectable influence on levels of violent felony crime. Uh, in recent years, the uh, New York Police Department has reduced the size of its force by 6,000 officers, yet crime continues to go down. So if crime was going down when they increased the number of cops and then crime continued to go down when they decreased the number of cops, then it leads you to believe that perhaps maybe there was no effect either way. On the margin, that's correct. Um, there could be other things in play, though. It could be that the police buildup was part of, you know, was one of a number of factors that drove crime down initially and then you don't need as many police officers to maintain a lower crime rate. I don't know, but it's not necessarily proof in and of itself what you just said, right? <coughs> Excuse me, that's correct. Um, but we had indicators of you know, 14 different other characteristics of precincts. It's socio-demographic composition, economic conditions, uh, and so forth. And controlling for all of these, we could not see any extra boost coming from putting more police in that precinct. All right. Now, I did not have data as to how those officers were deployed. Number two, policy number two, ComStat, one of the big innovations under Giuliani that I think has been copied around the country. And this was a pioneer program in the data revolution that we've all become so enamored of recently as applied to other things. And by keeping more meticulous records, about specific crimes at specific locations within each precinct, contacts between police officers and members of the public. Um, they attacked those streets or whatever that were the trouble spots to get things under control. Tell us what data you looked at with respect to ComStat and why you wound up skeptical of that. ComStat was introduced in 1994. Crime rates were already going down for several years before ComStat was introduced. If ComStat was reducing crime, we would expect the trend line of projecting the number of crimes or the crime rate over time uh, to drop at the point. And, or and, we would and we're going to put up a graph from within your study. Yes. You can see it on the screen. Our viewers can see it on their TVs. So describe what we're looking at. Yeah. The blue line shows <clears throat> the trends in violent crime. The red line, which is dashed, shows trends in property crime starting in 1988 and continuing to 2001. Uh, we see no discontinuity in the level of either line or in the slope. Crime continued to go down just as fast before, after ComStat, but no faster than it was going down before. You can see the violent crimes peaked around 1990, and property crimes were already going down monotonically starting in 1988. So therefore, perhaps, no impact of ComStat. Does it make intuitive sense to you, though, if you keep much better data and deploy police officers to where it seems like the hot spots are, uh, does it not make sense that it would do something? You would expect it to do so, but we do not know how ComStat was being used. I think it offered good potential for directing police resources to the places where they would make the most difference. 
were police actually targeted to those hot spots is something no one has studied. Um, another Giuliani initiative with Police Commissioner William Bratton cracking down on misdemeanors to prevent felonies, known as the broken windows approach. They began arresting people for small things they used to let go more of the time, turnstile jumping, panhandling, public urination, small amounts of marijuana. Uh, the idea was to keep clearing the streets of the same people who were most likely to later commit more serious crimes, I guess, and conventional wisdom, again, is that it worked. When uh, that program was introduced, uh, it was based heavily on an article, <coughs> excuse me, in the... <coughs> an article by the criminologist, uh, sociologist E.O. Wilson. Uh, E.O. Wilson is a biologist. James Q. Wilson. Uh, James Q. Wilson, Political sorry, scientist. Uh, George Kelling suggested that minor public disorder would make people feel uncomfortable going into a neighborhood and because respectable people would stay away, Criminals would be attracted uh, to that area, and crime would escalate. It made sense at the time, but we don't see evidence that it worked. My, uh, my study shows, for violent crimes at least, that uh, increasing misdemeanor arrests did not have uh, this effect. In the long run, it may actually be counterproductive because many of those misdemeanor arrests are obtained by stopping people who are innocently walking down the street, questioning them, frisking them, usually finding nothing on them, but people feel irritated, frustrated, annoyed, uh, especially if they believe that they are being stopped because of their race or ethnic background. So number of police officers, ComStat, uh, misdemeanor approach, trouble with finding data that really proves it, the other one, stop and frisk. And I know you couldn't directly test the Bloomberg Kelly stop and frisk numbers because your data set only went up to 2001. Uh, but you suggest that the decline in murders and shootings was just as fast before their stop and frisk program started as since. In addition, um, shootings have been pretty much uh, at a constant level over the last 10 years. If these stops were discouraging people from carrying guns on them and therefore indirectly affecting robberies and homicides, we would expect the level of shootings to go down. But that has not happened. What has been happening in the last decade is that more of the people being shot are surviving because of better care for trauma victims in the hospitals. Some of this is using techniques developed in Iraq and Afghanistan. All right, now stay here for a minute. Mm -hmm. And in a minute, Professor Greenberg will be joined by a fellow researcher who questions another aspect of crime policy, specifically whether the explosion of misdemeanor arrests does what it's supposed to do, stop petty criminals from graduating to major crimes. But to keep us focused on the people behind the data, let's take a brief detour and spend two minutes with a young public defender who deals with such arrests seven days a week. Here's a clip from the New York Times Op Doc online series, True Believers in Justice, produced by Don Porter. So I'm guessing this is your like ID number in the courtroom? Yeah, this is my bar number for the state. I always knew I wanted to be a public defender before I knew what a public defender was. I used to always get harassed by the police, and I said, I want to be somebody that prevents people from doing this. I love my job, I love my work, uh, I love my clients, but there are things that I hate. I hate how this country treats poor people, I hate how individuals treat poor people, and so that's my hate that keeps me fighting and I just like to fight like I've always been a fighter it just so happens this is the fight I'm in I listen to the theme of Rocky before every trial 
get a little cranked up and just get ready to go. When they say the state of Georgia versus Joe Blow, I look at it like you got to get through me to get to Joe Blow. The state repeatedly in their opening statement <clears throat> found it important to tell you that this is not a serious case, but it had serious consequences. Serious consequences for that young man. Find out what happens to that young man and his public defender at the New York Times site. Also in the HBO documentary Gideon's Army that premieres later this summer. Now on to more new research that is taking aim at that claim that low-level offenders graduate to commit violent crimes. Keep tabs on today's turnstile hopper, the theory goes, as a way to track and catch tomorrow's murderer. But according to a new analysis of roughly 40,000 first-time offenders tracked over a nine-year period, less than 4% were later convicted of felony crimes. We're joined now by researcher Issa Kohler Hausman, a fellow at the Georgetown University Law Center, PhD candidate in sociology at NYU. I understand <laughs> Professor Greenberg is your mentor. He is <laughs> one of my mentors, and a great one. So uh, a little reunion <laughs> here on the set. Um, well, tell us what you looked at. Um, I used a data set that comes from the, the New York State Division of Criminal Justice Services, which is the state agency that um, produces rap sheets, or the people whose job it is to keep track on people for the criminal justice system. Um, and so I followed the two only traceable cohorts um, of people newly entering the misdemeanor system. So over the last uh, maybe five years, about 80% of the people arrested each year in New York City for a misdemeanor offense don't have a prior felony record. So the next logical question would be, of those 80% that don't already have a felony conviction, what happens to them? Um, so I've done two projects out of this. One study I uh, published actually with Human Rights Watch um, following just people who were um, arrested for misdemeanor marijuana offenses, followed them forward for about six and a half to eight and a half years. And this uh, paper, which is forthcoming in the Stanford Law Review, is follows two cohorts. One is the misdemeanor um, marijuana dismissal cohort, and the other is people who had a first-time misdemeanor conviction. So following them forward for six and a half to eight and a half years, we found that only about three and a half percent had a violent felony conviction in that period. We're going to put up a graphic from your study. You can see it on the screen over there. Tell me what we're looking at. So this compares the two cohorts, and it shows that um, somewhere between 37 and 40 percent of each cohort had zero later arrests. And the reason that these cohorts are important is that New York State actually has fairly good what we call ceiling laws. And when I say good, I mean uh, protective of defendants. So if a case does not end in a conviction, the, the state actually is mandated to destroy your fingerprints in many instances so that, they, so that that fact of a mere arrest can't be used against you. Um, so these are cohorts that we can reliably track over time. The problem is that for many people who are arrested, if you just followed the entire group of people who were arrested for misdemeanor offense, you wouldn't really know what happened to them later because the state will issue you a new unique identifying number. Mm -hmm. So this shows that in truth, um, of these two traceable cohorts, we know that about 37 to 40% don't have a later arrest. We know that about 30% um, <clears throat> about of the people in the marijuana misdemeanor cohort had only misdemeanor arrests. And about 22 percent um, of the first-time misdemeanor conviction only had misdemeanor arrests. The important thing to notice here is that um, the people who already have a misdemeanor conviction are treated very differently in the system going forward. And that's because the system relies on these marks of, of your prior encounters because it's a very rapid adjudication process. And so you'll see that the people that had the dismissal have the same number of misdemeanor arrests, but they don't end up getting more convictions. So is the, if the takeaway is that most of the people being arrested for misdemeanors don't go on to commit felonies, mm -hmm. why couldn't that prove the broken windows theory? Because if they're catching these people into the system uh, earlier rather than letting them jump their turnstiles or get away with a small marijuana possession or whatever it is, um, that they are then somehow dissuaded from mm -hmm. going on to larger crimes or prevented from going on to larger crimes, why not conclude that rather than conclude that it didn't have an impact? Well, just to be clear, my study is not aimed at um, proving or disproving a, deter a deterrence hypothesis. Mm -hmm. My study is primarily asking about the trajectories of these people and how they're treated in courts. 
Having said that, I don't think that deterrence is really a logical conclusion to, to draw from, the, um, from this data for many reasons. First, a number of these people have later arrests, so it's not as if they're being dissuaded from having any contact. And second of all, you have to remember, very few of these people are actually convicted and formally punished. So we think of deterrence as something where um, swift and severe sanctions happen from a, an early criminal justice encounter, and that dissuades you. But many of these people have their cases dismissed or they have conditional discharges from their cases. So that would be an odd lesson that if you're treated leniently, you then decide not to commit a robbery because you're treated leniently for smoking marijuana. And I guess one of your observations is that it's not a criminal justice model at all, uh, looking at individuals and their individual guilt or innocence that the police department is employing it's what you call a managerial model. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to manage large populations. Is that right? That's right. I, I think that what's happened in, in New York City courts since the rise of what I call the era of mass misdemeanors in, in our city is, is really a fundamental shift as to how criminal courts operate. We think of the role of criminal courts as to adjudicate if the person did the bad act they were accused of. Um, but that takes a lot of time and resources to figure out if someone really did something. And so what happens in the courts um, is that a lot of times they'll just look at the record of who the person is. So if it's a first arrest, they'll tend to give you this form of conditional dismissal that's uh, unique to New York State called the adjournment in contemplation of dismissal. So they sort of track you for six months or a year and they see what happens if you're cycled back in. Um, and they often sort of don't get around to the question of factual guilt or innocence. So what's the alternative hypothesis here for both of you? If Increasing the number of officers, if ComStat, if the era of mass uh, misdemeanors, if stop and frisk, if incarcerating larger numbers of people for longer periods of time, all these things that have gone on over 20 plus years haven't reduced crime, what has? We don't know for sure. There's half a dozen hypotheses out there. Some of them have been tested and somewhat discredited. Uh, some years ago, Economist Stephen Lavitt and his collaborator John Donahue suggested that liberalized abortion laws meant fewer unwanted children are being born, fewer delinquents graduating to more serious crime as they get older. That's been disproven? Uh, it's not been disproven, but the effects couldn't have been as large as they initially estimated. It may have contributed. Uh, one of the most interesting uh, current hypotheses has to do with the removal of lead from the environment. Lead has damaging effects to the brain, especially in, when children are exposed to it. If you take lead out of gasoline, out of a house paint, then you get children who are less irritable, less likely to be hyperactive, uh, less, less aggressive growing up. And because the exposure to lead is highest in low-income minority neighborhoods, you would expect the removal of lead from the environment to bring about greatest drops in those communities, and that's exactly what we see. Also, cultural change. You have a line in your uh, study that says the social meaning of being young, unemployed, or black may well have changed over the decades covered by the data set, altering the relationship between the possession of these traits mm -hmm. and criminality. These things are harder to measure, and uh, my study did not at attempt to do that. Getting data on the meanings of these things you know, in each precinct for every year over a period of time, uh, we don't have the data uh, to enable us to do that. Did you set out to disprove everything all the police commissioners and mayors over the last 25 years have done? This was and undertaken as a preliminary study to do a more systematic study. My prior beliefs before doing this were that the strongest claims made by the heads of the police department, by the mayors, uh, are what were very implausible because crime dropped in many places in this country and in other countries. On the other hand, New York's crime drop was greater than in most other cities in the 90s, so uh, it would be perfectly reasonable to... And still today, something's going on where we're talking about record low murder rates in New York, whereas Chicago's exploding. Uh, Chicago has exploded in the last two years. Washington, D.C. has dropped by a factor of four in the last decade far in excess of what has happened in New York. Um, we do not know why. The, the head of the police uh, foundation uh, was 
was talking about this with me last week, said the police are scratching their heads. They don't know. So what, do you, what should the next mayor do? Fire all the police because it's not worth the investment? <laughs> Our study was a study of marginal effects. Take all the police out, let everyone out of the prison. That's a totally different picture. For many investments, there is a point of diminishing returns. And there may even be a tipping point. If you take too many people out of a community, young men, this may be destabilizing. There are fewer adults out to supervise the kids. Well, thank you very much for your provocative research and making us think and sharing it with us. Thank, thank you. you. Too bad about nuclear power. If it didn't cause disasters like Fukushima and have us worrying about nuclear waste and proliferation, it could give us a near endless source of electricity without greenhouse gases. Or maybe it still can. For years, Microsoft billionaire Bill Gates and others have been pouring money into something called the TWR, the Traveling Wave Reactor. What's happened to that idea? Let's begin our exploration with the Q&A after Bill Gates' original TED Talk about nuclear power. So, thank you. Um, just to understand more about, about uh, Terra Power, right? Um, I mean, first of all, what, what, can you give a sense of what sort of scale of investment this is? Well, to, to actually do this software, buy the supercomputer, hire all the great scientists, which we've done, that's only tens of millions. And even once we test our materials out uh, in a Russian reactor to make sure that our materials work properly, then you'll only be up in hundreds of millions. The tough thing is building the pilot reactor, uh, finding the several billion, uh, finding the, the regulator, the location that will actually build the first one of these. Once you get the first one built, if it works as advertised, then it's just clear as day because the economics, the energy density are so different than nuclear as we know it. And so to understand it right, this involves building deep into the ground, almost like, like a vertical kind of column of nuclear fuel of this sort of spent uranium. And then, and, then, and then the process starts at the top and kind of works down? That's right. Today, you're always refueling the reactor. So you have lots of people and lots of controls that can go wrong. That thing where you're opening it up and moving things in and out, that's, that's not good. So if you have very, <laughs> very cheap fuel, then you can put 60 years in, just think of it as a log, put it down and not have those same complexities. And it just sits there and burns for the 60 years, uh, and, and then it's done. It's a, it's a nuclear power plant that is its own waste disposal solution. Yeah, well, what happens with the waste, you can, you can let it sit there. Uh, there's a lot less waste under this approach. Uh, then you can actually take that and put it into another one and burn that. And, and we start out actually by taking the waste that exists today that's sitting in these cooling pools or dry casking by reactors. That's our fuel to begin with. So the thing that's been a problem from those reactors is actually what gets fed into ours, and you're reducing the volume of the waste quite dramatically as you're going through this process. That from Bill Gates' TED Talk, boosting a new generation of nuclear power. How would such reactors be safer? And are we being too cautious, not at least trying out new technologies? Joining us via Skype from Hanover, New Hampshire, Robert Hargraves, author of Thorium, Energy Cheaper Than Coal. On the other side of the fence on this, environmentalist Jim Riccio, nuclear policy analyst for Greenpeace. He joins us via Skype from Washington, D.C. Hello to both of you. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, Thank you, Brian. Robert Hargraves, let me start with you. We just heard Bill Gates explain how Terra Power uh, and that reactor model could be safer to refuel. What other advantages are there to Terra Power, in your opinion? Well, first of all, before we say it's safer, we have to understand that nuclear power is right today already the safest form of electric power generation. Uh, Bill Gates said that it would be a little bit safer because they wouldn't have to refuel the reactor so often and expose the radioactive materials to the environment while they were doing that. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the reason for that. The other big plus for his reactor is the uh, availability of very inexpensive fuel. That reactor will burn uranium-238, internally converting it to fissile plutonium that provides the power for that reactor. 
Uh, well, Jim Riccio, let me turn to you. If energy demand will triple by 2030, as many people project that it will, and nuclear power is cheaper, which will help us get off coal faster, and there are these new models that are supposed to be safer, why not embrace making nuclear technology safer rather than trying to avoid it altogether? Well, because again, you know, splitting atoms to generate electricity is a very dangerous way to make electricity. Um, and the Gates reactor is actually a warmed over version of 1950s technology that has proven to be problematic. These are fast breeder reactors and even the highly touted French have been unable to make the fast breeders actually work. So, so I, I don't see this as being cheaper. In fact, it's one of those reactor designs that may never make it off the drawing board. Robert Hargraves, your reaction? Well, uh, he's right. We have tried uh, fast reactors several times, and uh, in most cases, they haven't turned out to be economically uh, practical. The initial impetus was that there wasn't enough uranium-235 in the world to fuel them all, so they uh, tried hard to invest in this breeder reactor. Eventually, the price of uranium came down that it was not really that necessary. There's still one running in Russia, a fast breeder reactor, and the Russians have a new model that they are uh, planning to sell and install in China. Bill Gates's reactor is indeed a sodium cool fast reactor, but with a uh, different sort of configuration than the older integral fast reactor. What's so different about it? Internally, the reactor's uh, fuel pins are kept within the reactor at all times for perhaps the 30 or 40 year cycle. Uh, the integral fast reactor had the fuel pins removed and uh, there was some reprocessing that, reprocessing that took place on the uh, site of the reactor. So this one confines the uh, material to within the reactor vessel for the entirety of the fuel cycle. Now, viewers, there's a new movie coming out in June of this year called Pandora's Promise. We're going to show you a clip. It showcases some big names in the environmental movement who are more accepting of nuclear, names like Stuart Brand, Richard Rhodes, Gwyneth Cravens, Mark Linus, and Michael Schellenberger. So let's take a look at a brief video clip of the movie's director speaking about this new trend in the environmental movement. I would call it like a more enlightened, an enlightenment environmentalism, which says, look, we're here. There's going to be 10 billion of us, 9 billion of us pretty soon. We're not going anywhere. We're not going to be retreating. The reality is we're going to keep encroaching. And how do we, how do we make that encroachment as environmentally benign as possible? And the only way you can do that is to not reject technology, but embrace technology, improve technology. Don't, don't say no nuclear power. Say better nuclear power. So Jim Riccio from Greenpeace. What do you think? What should our viewers think? Uh, I think, there again, there are better ways to generate electricity than by splitting atoms. Um, the, most, of the, most of the electricity we put on the grid last year, or half of the electricity we put on the grid last year, came from renewable energy. Uh, both UBS and Deutsche Bank are pointing out a, uh, a revolution in, in solar that's coming down the pike in terms of what's going on rooftops. Um, I just don't see that this technology meets the requirements, number one, of cost or of safety. Because again, with sodium, um, you introduce sodium to oxygen and you have some major issues on your hands that they experienced in both Japan and elsewhere. Robert um, Hargraves, uh, Jim Riccio has said twice now that splitting atoms is simply a dangerous way to produce energy. Do you disagree with the premise that there's something inherently dangerous about splitting atoms to produce energy? Do I, Bob Hargraves? No. Correct. I, I, there's nothing that's... All energy release has the potential to cause harm in the sense that you have a lot of energy cooped up somewhere. I mean, just an LNG tanker in Boston Harbor has more energy cooped up in it than the weapons that were used in Japan. So we have to be cautious any time we have a lot of energy that needs to be controlled and then distributed. But no, I would not say that uh, splitting atoms is inherently a dangerous activity. Were you given pause by Fukushima? Because if that kind of thing can happen and does happen, even if very rarely, that that's just not a risk that humanity should be prepared to have to take? I believe that 
first of all, the Hirosh the uh, Fukushima accident really did not kill or harm people. Uh, we are overly sensitive to the potential harm from low levels of uh, radiation that have been spread across that part of Japan by that accident. It's a problem for sure. We want to avoid it. But uh, in terms of comparisons to other accidents that happen in generating electricity, nuclear power is today as uh, generates one tenth the number of fatalities as, say, natural gas for the same amount of power that's produced on the grid. Natural gas? Are you comparing energy from nuclear reactors, Robert Hargraves, uh, favorably to natural gas? This is supposed to be the big new thing, fracking, to produce natural gas. Well, we are really fortunate here in the U.S. because we have suddenly come across a gold mine of natural gas. And we can replace a lot of coal burning with natural gas and emit less than half of the CO2 that we emit by burning coal. But, but, but it's more dangerous than nuclear? Is that what you're arguing? Um, it happens to be in, in the sense that we have had more accidents with natural gas that have harmed or killed people than we have with nuclear power in the United States. That is correct. And Jim Rickerell, I guess you're going to agree on this point. Neither of you maybe are big fans of fracking. Neither of us are fans of fracking. <laughs> Well, I, I, I'm not a fan of it, but I think that it's going to be a bridge. It's going to be a way we can reduce CO2 emissions until we come up with a better scheme. And I believe that better scheme is nuclear power, and in particular, advanced nuclear power technologies, such as the Terra Power Reactor or the Thorium Molten Salt Reactor. And Jim Riccio, how fast can we scale renewables? Because this is what every well-intentioned policymaker seems to run up against even when they envision uh, a renewable energy-based world, you just can't get there fast enough for the demand of the typical American lifestyle and increasingly the typical global lifestyle. Well, we can certainly get there more rapidly than by pursuing a, you know, the traveling wave reactor because, again, we're not going to have even a model by 2025 from last I've seen. Um, and, again, that's only the first of its kind. So you're not going to have that reactor bringing electricity online any time in the future. And between now and 2025, you're going to be seeing renewables being brought online at a more rapid pace. Again, every single electron that was put on the grid in January was from renewable electricity. What, what do you mean every single electron that was put on the grid in January? We have oil and coal and all those other energy sources. Sorry, new, new additions to the grid. All new, the new electricity that was added to the grid in January all came from renewable energy, and half of it last year came from renewable energy as well. So, Robert Hargraves, do, do you agree that the conversation that we're having right here, right now, is so hypothetical that no um, TRW reactor would even come online for at least another 12 years? First of all, the amount of energy on the grid is about a fifth from coal, about a fifth from gas, about a fifth from nuclear power here in the U.S. Uh, so uh, of the renewables, the vast majority of that is hydropower. Uh, and there are small amounts of uh, solar and wind that are added. Repeat your question, though. I'm sorry. Well, I, I was asking because Jim said we're talking about 2025 at least. Uh, before the Bill Gates envisioned reactors could even start to go online. So is that how hypothetical and theoretical a conversation we're having as opposed to a real world one? Well, the question is, where are they going to go online? It seems unlikely they would go online in the U.S. because it takes so many decades to get uh, licensing approved for new reactor designs. Uh, we have new designs for the AP-1000, for example, that Westinghouse is now building in the U.S. and in China and has contracts to build other places. But for a new reactor, a new design, a new technology to be adopted, we probably will have to have that accomplished outside of the rather slow regulatory uh, mm -hmm. uh, pace in the United States. We, we just have a minute left. Jim Ricky, I'll give you the last word. Do you think, based on the film clip that we saw, that there's a wedge forming in the environmentalist community along generational lines, with younger environmentalists being more open to new kinds of nuclear power? 
Um, actually, what I think is that you have those that are more open to selling nuclear than actually promoting it. Um, again, um, you have a bunch of people that have been in the pay of the nuclear industry who are promoting new forms of technology. Environmentalists um, in the pay of the nuclear industry? Environmentalists in the pay yeah. of the nuclear industry. <laughs> and that will be good fodder for our next discussion. Thank you both very much for joining us. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Nuclear power is still unsettled. And that's our program for this week. We premiere a new show every Wednesday evening at 7.30. And tune into my radio program weekdays 10 a.m. till noon on WNYC 93.9 FM and AM 820. Tomorrow, a New York City kid explores rural gun culture. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching.